Where are we now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Exodus 13. Praise you, Father in heaven. Bless you. May, you. may you give us all understanding and may you give me the utterance and the organization of my thoughts that I might bring this forth in a manner that will edify some of us, all of us, hopefully, and be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So here we go. Um, now, this actually coincides, Exodus 13 coincides with other scripture in the Bible, and I'm going to bring up all of this in, uh, very soon here. Verse 1, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me the firstborn whatsoever openeth the wound among, among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. So first of all, that word sanctified means set aside, right? Make holy, consecrate. You know, the, the, the Hebrew word is, uh, is Kadesh. And we're going to see that. That We're going to explain what the Kadesh is in a minute. Um, so sanctify unto me all the firstborn whatsoever openeth the womb means the first one out of the womb, right? Uh, of both man and beast is mine. Now listen to what it says here. This is going on. Verse 3. And Moses said unto the people, remember this day in which he came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So he's saying, remember where you came out from, from bondage, to remember the day. For by strength of the hand of the Lord brought you out from this place, there shall be no leavened bread be eaten. This day came ye out in the month of Abib. There's a few things right there already, leavened bread. Now, you know, leavened bread, the reason why, he, you know, he prepared them, remember in, in, in Exodus 12, he prepared them uh, the night before for a quick getaway. That's pretty much what it was. If you remember correctly, he said, you know, that the whole, the thing about leaven is not, it's not allowing the time for the bread to, to, to you know, to rise or whatever. And, it, what, and what did it say in, in um, Exodus 12? If you go back to verse eight, it says, they shall eat the flesh in that night, they're talking about the lamb, roast it with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat. So you're supposed to, here, listen to what it says. Eat not it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his heads, head and his legs and the pertinence thereof. So basically what that says is roast the whole thing in one piece. Don't take the head off. Don't take the, you know, with the legs and everything. And the pertinence means the guts. So they were literally throwing the thing on a, on a on a, a spick or whatever they call it, a spear and uh, and turning it and roasting the whole thing, and it says in verse ten, "Ye shall eat nothing; let it remain until morning, and which remaineth of it until morning, ye shall burn with fire, and thus ye shall eat it with your loins girded, and your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover." So he's preparing them. Remember this with the unleavened bread and and the way they're cooking the, the animal. And he says, have your, your loins girded. What did they do? Why did they used to gird their loins? They would tie up their tunic around their loins, around their body, and between their legs and, their, and around their body so that they could run. That's what was, what was the, the, or, or go to battle, either one of the two. They would go into battle like that, or they would do that when they wanted to run. So what, he's preparing them to run. Right. And then it says, you know, and your shoes on your feet. So you're, you're, you be ready to run and the staff already in your hand. So imagine staff in one hand, eating with the other in haste. So he was preparing them in 12 to get for a quick getaway. But remember something. This is the night before. This is the way it was all throughout their escape. Remember, it did, they didn't make it from 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 um, Egypt to the Red Sea in just like, you know, a matter of a day. They, they spent days on their way out and and um and they would cook the un the, the the bread on the rocks and not give it time to rise with no ribbon so it wouldn't rise so it would cook without rising would which would take longer and they would uh, make the, and they would get up and go in haste that's what the whole thing um was about as far as the uh the, the unleavened bread and it, and it says not to be eaten when he talks about it now he says there'll be no uh Leavened bread to be eaten in the feast of, of un, unleavened bread. Get out of here, cow. Uh, and so that's what that was all about. It was all about 
uh, escaping in haste and in remembrance of escaping with haste. Okay, so verse, uh, and then it says, um, verse four, this day came ye out of the month of Abib. Now we know going back to uh, 12, the month of Abib, what he called it, uh, what did he call it? He called it the first month, uh, you know, on the calendar, right? It was the first of months. So hang on a second here. The first of months, would that be considered the new year? It's, it's, it's crazy. But there are Jews that, that consider the Passover the new year. And there are Jews that consider Rosh Hashanah uh, the new year. And uh, they're actually both. One is the celebration, like here, Abib became the, the, the month of Tishri after. Abib became the month of Tishri, which is the, the, the first on the calendar. But that being said, or hang on. Immortalized in recording. <laughs> and, but that being said, no, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Nisan was a uh, Tishri. Uh, this, this, hang on a second. No, I'm getting mixed up here. Forgive me. This, this, this month, Abib became Nisan after. Okay. And that is considered the first month of the year. The, um, the, the month Tishri, where they call it the Jewish New Year now in Rosh Hashanah, is actually the seventh month. Okay. So it's, Six months later, it's the beginning. It's, it's around the seventh month on the Gregorian calendar. It's in April, you know. It, it, uh, this is in April. It's in uh, October. So that Rosh Hashanah is in October, and this here, this feast of uh, unleavened bread, the Passover, is in April. So they're both considered, in one way, the New Year. And why? Because one, this one here. The, the Passover feast is considered the birth of the of the of the of the of the Israel Israelites of the nation of Israel leaving the, the, the bondage and it's the birth of the, the nation of Israel. Whereas the other one is the um, the birth of Adam and Eve. So there are two things that are celebrated as the new year. And they, they even argue about it up to this point, okay? So, so uh, just to say that, you know, uh, it's not really important. All that's important, like we discuss all the time, is the grace. We're getting to the grace. I might be going, taking the long way around, but we're getting to the grace. And it shall be, verse 5, and it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Armorites and the Hivites and the, Je and the Jebusites, which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee, a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. So the Feast of, of, of Unleavened Bread, the seven days, it says here, verse six, seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread. And in the seventh day, thou shalt be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall be no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen within all thy quarters. Now remember something. Most of the time in the Bible, the um, leaven is associated with, uh, with sin and with uh, doctrines, uh, false doctrine, uh, as, as, as Paul referred to it. But didn't Jesus also say that the kingdom of heaven is, like, is, like, is as leaven? And uh, I believe that's in Matthew. Let me look it up. The kingdom of heaven. Jesus said it. So it shows you that, you know, there can be, it could be considered good too, depending on how you interpret the kingdom of heaven. I'm looking it up uh, in my program here. Kingdom of heaven is as leaven. So it was Matthew 13, 13, 13, 33, 13, 33. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and mixed with about 60 pounds of flour. And what is that representing? That represents that once that leaven, the kingdom of heaven, once it's inserted, once the gospel 
is spoke about, it will grow and grow and grow until it encompasses, encompasses pretty much the whole world, right? So it shows you that leaven is not always considered evil, like in the way of sin or doctrines of demons. Jesus used the word leaven to show that the, that the good of the gospel will spread out the same way bad leaven would spread out. Very interesting. So it says, uh, verse eight, and thou shalt shew thy son in that day, saying, this is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be a sign unto thee upon thine hand for a, for a memorial between thine eyes and the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. With a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in his season from year to year. So remember something. This is very, you know, this was passed down through generations, talking from the father to the son. And we're going to see why he set aside and consecrated in a minute. There's redemption here. They're, you know, they go to the God, they go to God to redeem their sons. Because, because what did God do? He took away the firstborn of all of Egypt. So now, in order to for them to uh, to be in remembrance, they go to God in in to redeem theirs with sacrifice. So, what we're seeing here, what we're seeing here, and what does it say here? It says it, it'll be a sign upon thine hand and a memorial between thine eyes. We're going to get to that. That's important. That's important what that is right there. That is the, the tefillin. That is the thing that they put on their foreheads and, and their arm right near their heart. And they, 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 they put the band down to their finger. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. Okay. So it says, therefore, keep this ordinance in his season from year to year. So it means all throughout your generations. Watch, watch what it's going to say here. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring unto the, uh, thee unto the land of the Canaanites, as he swear unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it to thee, thou shalt set apart unto the Lord that all that openeth the matrix, and every firstling that come of a beast, when thou hast, the males shall be the Lord's. So that's the first time he mentions males. Earlier on in the chapter, he didn't mention males. He said firstborn. Here he makes it specific, the firstborn male. Now, what the <laughs> you use the word matrix that openeth the matrix. The matrix basically, the word is rachem, and it means womb. So where he whereas the word womb was used earlier in the chapter, here they use the word matrix in the in the English translation, but it means the womb. And so it says basically, every first male that comes out of the womb will be the Lord's. And that means man and beast that cometh. First thing that comes from beast, and the male shall be the Lord's. Man and beast. And the, every firstling of an ass, thou, uh, of an ass, thou shalt redeem with a lamb. Well, what lamb redeemed us? Huh? So think about this now. Every, every firstling of an ass, thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if thou will not redeem it, he's talking about, um, remember something, of an ass, of, of the beast now. He's not talking about man. He says, and if that shall, thou shalt not redeem it, then thou shalt break its neck. So in other words, if you don't redeem it with a lamb, you have to kill it. You have to kill it. So then it says, right after that, thou shalt break its neck and all the firstborn of man among thy children, thou shalt redeem. Shall thou redeem. And it shall be when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, what is this? Thou shalt say unto him, by the strength of the hand of the Lord, brought us out of Egypt from the house of bondage. So basically here, the redemption, and that word redeem, what does it mean? The word redeem means pay ransom for. So this sacrifice is a ransom for them to get back the, the, the right of, 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 of their sons to live. Because otherwise, what do you say? If he's not redeemed, you know, well, it says about, of the animals. If it's not redeemed, you have to kill it. Of course, he's not going to say that about, about, you know, the sons. Uh, but he's saying they have to be redeemed. They have to be, you have to put that lamb. And that lamb, remember something, in Hebrews 13, sorry, in Hebrews 10, 
Hebrews 10, it says the blood of the blood of animals cannot wash away sin. The blood of animals well, does not please God. The, the blood of so it's but it's only in the beginning of chapter 10, it says. Uh, the law being only a shadow of the good things to come. So a shadow of the good things to come. It, it's it's a re in remembrance. So here, this redemption, this sacrifice of a lamb is only in is, is only a reminder of what what transpired. That's all it is. And you know, it talks about this is basically this is called in the in the um, uh and that redeem, that, that word, that redeem, get this, that redeem, the word is, oh, it's pada, it's not what I thought, it's a ransom. There's another word, one second here. Anyway, it, this is called, in, in Exodus um, 13, verses 1 to 10, this is called the Kadesh in the, Jewish, in the Jewish religion. It's the Kadesh. And what it is, it's basically the duty of the Jewish people to always remember the redemption. From the in, in Egyptian bondage, it is the duty to always remember. And then you have the sister verses. You have the sister verses in Deuteronomy, and that's called the Shema. And the Shema is the pronouncing of the unity of God, of the one God. So now, but I want to I want to read you what it says in the Shema because it says they're almost the same thing. It says, "Now these are the commandments, the statutes." And the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might have them in the land whither you go to possess it. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God. Keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee. Thou and thy son and thy son's sons all the days of thy life and that thy days may be prolonged. And then it's very, very famous uh, verses that are coming now. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, and it may be well with thee, and that they, ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Here it is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And thou shalt love thy God, love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thine soul, and with all thine might. And these words which I command this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children thou shalt talk of listen to this thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house thou shalt walketh when thou shalt walketh by the way and well that when thou shalt lieth down and when they shall be frontless and they shall be frontless between thine eyes sorry and they shall bind them for a sign upon a sign upon thine hand and they shall be frontless between thine eyes and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy heart, thy, thy house, and on thy gates. So what's it saying here? It's saying, basically, that the same thing in Exodus 13, that they're to write them and they're to put them, they'll shall, they shall be signs on the hand, the right hand, but on the right arm, which is right beside the heart. And, and the, that band goes down the hand all the way to the third finger, end of the third finger, and then up onto the head with on, on, on the frontlets uh, of, the, of the eyes, it basically between on the forehead, basically. So what it is, this is the tefillin. This is what they do to this day, the, uh, the Jews. They do it and they'll say prayers. And in these things that are, uh, they're basically cubes. And in, uh, in the commentary it talks about them being pouches. Maybe in the very beginning, they were just little pouches that were made. Today, they are black cubes. And that's a whole other discussion in itself. What, what I mean, when you talk about black cubes, there's Mecca and there's all kinds of things, Saturn worship and all this crap. But anyway, uh, this is a, a whole other a whole other subject on itself. But today, what they do is they put these things on uh, on them and they make prayers. And in them are the statutes and the laws, some of some of the things of the Torah. And in, and interestingly, in um, in Deuteronomy, it also mentions, "And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house." And on thy gates, that is the mezuzah. And Pastor and I always talk about the mezuzah, and we mix up the words or whatever. But the mezuzah is that little uh, Torah with uh, that's with with scriptures inside it that you see uh, nailed or, or or screwed onto this side of every entrance of a of a Jewish home. You know, so all this to say that this here 
these, this, what he's talking about here is a supposed to be a reminder on your hand and on your forehead. It's, a, it's supposed to be a reminder. But then what happens? And I remember, oh, and by the way, in, incidentally, I find it very, is it, is it just by coincidence or whatever that here in, in 16, which I'm getting ahead of myself, but we'll get back to here in verse 16. This is Exodus 13, verse 16. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to read the rest because I have lots to say on this. So Exodus 13, verse 16. And it shall be a token upon thine hand for frontlets between thine eyes for the strength of hand of the Lord that brought us out of Egypt. So once again, a, 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 a token, a mark, a, 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 a symbol on your hand and on, and on your forehead for <laughs> reminding when they brought out, out of Egypt. But, but here's the thing, get this, and I found this out, I realized this this morning. This is Exodus 13, verse 16. Well, we know how the devil is, is, a, is a counterfeiter and a copier, right? What does it say in Revelation 13, verse 16? Now, remember something. It's, it, you know, not, is it coincidence? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. I mean, you know, you don't have to, you can believe what you want to believe. We're all given that choice, right? But why is it in the 13th chapter of this, uh, in the 16th verse of the 13th chapter in both of these? Revelation 13, verse 16 says, we know what this is about. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Now realize something. You know, a lot of people say in, oh, they're going to inject the chip into it. They're going to do that. They're going to do this in. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's go to the translation. The word that they translated uh, to in is epi. That's the, that's the Greek word. But what is the definition of epi? It's on or upon. So who knows what it's going to be? We don't know what the mark is going to be. We don't really care, do we? Because we won't get it. We're saved. Right. But but, you know, it could be even be a tattoo. You know, it says it could be this or that or or the number of the beast. Remember something. Uh, um, remember something that uh, what you might call it. Um, barcodes scan barcodes They They start with six. They have a six in the middle and they end with six. Just food for thought. So but I just found it amazing that, you know, here in Exodus 13, they're talking about a token, um, um, you know, that will be on your forehead and on your right hand that you, you're supposed to do in remembrance to the bondage being freed from the bondage of God. Well, you know, the devil coming in and, and, and doing the same thing to what? To put you back into bondage. All these people will be going to the lake of fire. Anybody who takes, who worships the beast and takes his mark, right? That, I, th I found that, I, that blew me away when I found that out this morning. I, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Anyway, so I'm going to go back now. Here we go. And we're go oh, and um, just to, um, we'll get to it in a second. Just, just to, to make, to make a, a point of knowing that these uh, tokens and marks, well, God changed it. God, God came in and he, uh, and he changed it. Okay. And that's, we're going to read about that in a minute. So now. So now here we go back to the um, back to Exodus 13. Uh, and it shall come to pass, verse 15, it shall come to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, and he's tell, giving the reason to the son now, I sacrifice to the Lord all that openeth the matrix being males. But all the firstborn of my children, I redeem. Well, actually, I think that's the Lord talking. Um, so, what does he say? He's saying all the firstborn of the children are redeemed by that sacrifice. Now, remember something. This is only a motion, a shadow of things to come, because because if 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 it would have washed away all that, this is only remembrance. This is only remembrance of things to come because. If it would have, if it would have taken care of it with one sacrifice for all the for all the coming children, if it would have got, gotten rid of uh, of whatever that that um, not a curse, but I don't know how I don't know how to put it that that uh, 
that com that uh, commandment that um that con the what's the word i'm looking for declaration that declaration by the lord you know when when he when he said this if it would have taken care of it with one sacrifice when they, they would have stopped right but he said no he said of thy son and thy son's son and he says and remember it's all through the years so this sacrifice of of uh of a lamb was done over and over and over again but he changed it he changed it let me keep going on just a bit and it came to pass when fire would hardly let us go that the lord slew all the firstborn in the land of egypt both firstborn of man firstborn of beast Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all that openeth the matrix. Again, the womb, the first end of the womb. Being males, but all the firstborn of my children, I redeem. And it shall be a token. Here it is again, 16. Remember, in Revelation 13, 16, it says the opposite. And we know where it comes from. So in, in verse 16, it shall be a token upon thine hand for the frontlets between thine eyes, for thy strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. But just a minute. So... Now this is a, a token, a sign that is on the hand, that is on the statutes that are on the hand, that are on the, the forehead and, and uh, or the hand and, and realize that it means the arm. If, where they do it now, where they do the, when they do this uh, to fill in thing with their cubes, they do it on the left arm, which is close to the heart and the band goes down to the hand. So, but listen to what, what listen to what the Lord said. The Lord himself prophesied what he was gonna do. The Lord himself prophesied that he was going to change it, that there was going to be a new, a new covenant, right? This is, you know, this is here in Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days will come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt which my covenant they break. Although, so, you know, <laughs> how many people break the covenant with God you know, or did break the covenant with God, right? By grace, you are saved. And <laughs> lest any man should boast, only by grace. So what did, what did our gracious God do here? He says, you know, he says, you know, uh, of which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them. So in other words, he never broke uh, his covenant. God never broke his covenant. God never left us or forsook us. But, but we did, or our ancestors or whatever. Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. Verse 33 in Jeremiah 31. But in this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put in my law in their inward parts, and I will write it in their hearts. And will their God, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord. They shall all know me. So he, God came in and, and, and fixed it. He fixed it. And he came in and basically he made a new covenant covenant. And as it says in Hebrews 10, he taketh away the first to establish a second. That was the sacrifice, the one time sacrifice that God made, that the father made. He gave his only begotten son so that we would not have to continue doing this because obviously it, it was only in remembrance. This, as God, as God says, you know, as God's word says, it, it, the blood of animals uh, you know, of oxes and, and lambs that will not satisfy him, right? So what happened? He came in and he fixed it. God fixed it. You know, and remember something. Here. For they shall all know me for the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will, I didn't finish it. This is the last, the end of the verse in Jeremiah 31 was on the next page, forgive me. 30 in verse 31, uh, verse 434 in Jeremiah 31. And it says at the very end, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember no more their sin. So what was a remembrance of sin 
and all the other things and, and the taking out of bondage and this and that and all those sacrifices, as it says, um, could never cleanse, cleanse us of sin, as it says in Hebrews 10. In, in Jeremiah 31, he tells, he prophesies, our, the Father in heaven prophesied about giving his son as a, as a one-time sacrifice. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said in Matthew 26, 27, and he took the cup. Remember, this is, and when is this? When is this? This is the Passover. This is the last meal, the last supper. It is Passover. It is when, when, they, when they had, at, when he had the last meal with the apostles. Notice, it started with Passover and it ended with Passover, the, the, the old covenant. And now what does Jesus say? And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament. And that word, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And that word testament here, that word testament is diatheke. Diatheke. That's the, that's the Greek word. And what does it translate to? What is it? What's the meaning of it? Covenant. Okay. So when, when you hear somebody saying, oh, it's in the New Testament, they're virtually saying it's in the New Covenant. And God came and he fixed it for us. How gracious is our God? How gracious is our God? You know, hang on a second here. I thank him every day for my salvation. You can never thank him enough. You can never thank enough to your Lord and Savior for redeeming you. What does redeem mean? It means he paid the ransom. He paid the ransom that you couldn't pay. I praise God. I thank him, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. And now, moving on. Moving on. So, we, you know, just remember. Just remember. As it, much as it says, as I read in, in Deuteronomy 6, that we're to talk, that they were to talk to their children and talk to the people and teach the people and, and bring to remembrance when they got up, when they were in their homes, when they were walking, and when they lay down, they were to talk about this and bring it to remembrance all the time. We are to do the same thing. We are to bring to remembrance what Jesus did. We are to preach the gospel. We are to thank God when we get up. Thank him as we walk through the day. Thank him in our house. Be, a, be a, 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 an example for your children. Be an example for all those around you. And, you know, you don't have to clobber people over the head, you know, but you should be out there saying, listen, it's good news. He fixed it. He fixed it. All you have to do is believe. Believe it in your heart and profess it with your mouth. And believe it in your heart. And it's your heart that God looks at. Remember something. God knows your heart better than you know it. So, you know, you can never, you can never talk about Jesus enough. Now, you don't have to repeat yourself the same thing over and over again. But bring him into the conversation when you're telling him. And, and you know, you're going to get, you're going to get hit. By Antichrist, I mean, you know, as, as far as the, the Jewish religion, I think pretty much anybody in the Jewish religion still has that spirit of Antichrist. I know I had, I had it, I had to get rid of it. And I, I'll tell you what, even once in a while, every once in a while, I, there's a tinge that I, that I recognize. I go, what? Where did that come from? When you hear the name Jesus, and there's just a, a little tinge, of, uh, like a microscopic thing that you, that, is almost like unrecognizable. But thank the Lord that he's shown me. Praise you, Lord. Thank you for the things you have shown me that I learned to recognize it. And I literally still have to kick little pieces of it. And I don't know how it gets back in. I have no idea. But I have to kick pieces of it out. So I pretty much believe that 
every Jew, every Jew that is, hasn't come to Jesus has got these spirits of Antichrist. So you're going to line up getting those spirits coming at you, remember, but do not let it stop you. And remember something, if you can't argue with a religious spirit, you can't argue because they're going to just keep arguing and arguing and arguing. So what do you do? You say, I'm not arguing about it. And then you give it to the Lord and you pray in stealth, pray in the secret place. Lord, please show them what they need to be shown. All right, we're going to get back to 13 now. The pillars of cloud and fire. Verse 17, and it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God let the, led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure, lest perhaps the people would repent when they see war. So would repent mean change direction, right? Change their mind. And they would return to Egypt. He knew. Look, they. what did they say when they got to the other side of the sea? They he said, yeah, but now we got nothing to eat. You know, we were better off in Egypt. At least we had a bowl of porridge in the morning. I mean, <laughs> you know, you, you, can't, you can't make this stuff up. Go. We are so in the flesh. You know, we are so in the flesh. But what did, what did Jesus say? You know, these words I speak to you are spirit. The flesh profiteth nothing. It is the spirit that quickeneth. Remember that. Remember that. So every time, you know, you, you make a choice for whatever it is about flesh, like, 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 like all of Israel, we're ready to do, <laughs> we're ready to go back. At least we had a bowl of porridge. <laughs> so God here didn't take them by the way of the Philistines so that they wouldn't be tempted. That when they would see the war, when they would see whatever, whatever it would be when they, when their flesh would be tempted or their, or or, or they would accept a spirit of fear or whatever it would be. They, he didn't allow them to see it. He took, them, he took them out of that. He took them out of the way and he led them the, the long way around. But get, now listen to what it says here. Verse 18, but God led the people about through the way of the wilderness and of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones away hence with you. So Joseph knew, Joseph knew that what was to come, he knew that God was going to come and that he would take his bones out of Israel and out of um, Egypt and, and, and he would be buried in the land of milk and honey. That's amazing. Verse 20, and they took their journey from Sukkot and encamped in Etham at the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way. And by night, a pillar of fire to give them light and to go by day and night. He took them not away. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day. So he was always there. He was always there for them to see. And, and he gave them light by night, right? nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. And what does it say in the book of Revelation? That the sun and the moon won't even give their light anymore because the glory of God will light up. Will light up our, our, our way for off. We'll give light and there will be no more darkness. No more darkness. So anyway, a lot of things in Exodus 13 here. I hope I didn't leave anything out because there's, there's a lot of stuff. But anyway. That's my take, Exodus 13. God bless you all. Praise the Lord. Praise you. Thank you, Father in heaven. Can never thank you. Amen.